Okay, we are into another one of our modules here for our barrier management section or module. Um, and we're talking specifically about fire barrier management. Um, and I have a comment here, not just the red stuff. You know, it is, I guess, ubiquitous in our industry that, um, and myself included, that, you know, when you don't know a lot about um, barrier management and you don't know about the technical specifications, and you just understand that you don't want fire to pass through or smoke to pass through. You know, I know that we've all made a good faith effort in our profession to address these issues by, you know, making sure that we, we fill these holes. You know, that's been, I think that's been our obsession more or less, is make sure the holes are filled. Um, and this session is going to be one of those real eye openers um, for many folks. I mean, some of you have certainly never even really discussed in any great detail uh, barrier management and and walls and and uh, you know penetrations and caulking and sealing and UL listings before um, some of you have been to these seminars and symposiums if you've been around ashy much uh, you certainly have been um, possibly through these symposiums in fact ashy for several years now uh, has been out there sort of really pushing this education um, because it is such a major issue with the, um, the government and with accreditation agencies and organizations. And I think they, you know, the, especially the Joint Commission particularly, uh, they just got fed up with, um, you know, there seemed to be a lot of ignorance out there about, uh, for a barrier, about barrier management from the HFL industry. So, you know, what we're planning to do in this session, this will not make you an expert by any means, but it will definitely bring a level of awareness that certainly, um, if you've not stepped into healthcare before, uh, will make you different day one. Uh, for those of you, who, of you who have been in healthcare for a little while, it should absolutely raise your awareness. Uh, for those of you who uh, have been through barrier management and understand this at a pretty competent level, hopefully uh, there'll be a, a couple of good uh, refreshers in this in this uh, over in this um, presentation or lecture, and also. If anything, we all just want to increase our level of competence so, again, we can continue to be different day one. And, you know, I joke there, not just the red stuff, but um, and I think that is absolutely true. I know for a fact that probably the majority of folks out there believe if we if we just have red stuff, you know, showing in our penetrations, um, then we're good to go. But I think, as, again, as you'll find when we get through the end of this, we're, we're certainly probably not good to go. And in fact, we have a long way to go uh, when it comes to fire barrier management. When it comes to uh, barrier management and really when it comes to maintaining them for fire purposes, you know, there are, there are some basic construction elements to what we're dealing with. You know, on walls, uh, basically we know we're dealing with block or CMU or that is masonry and concrete. Uh, we have solid concrete, uh, gypsum, drywall, if you will, and plaster is what we see pretty much all the time. And for floors, it's typically concrete and wood frame. Uh, probably somewhat self-explanatory, but good to just to know that, you know, this, these are some of the materials that we're, we're pretty consistently dealing with. Now we want to talk about the different types of uh, barriers, and I'm going to use the NFPA, not necessarily the IBC, um, because the IBC and the NFPA, they differ a little bit here. Uh, IBC has a little more, um, uh, I guess they, I'm going to say they're more comprehensive, but they have an additional definition that I don't want to confuse you with. Uh, when it comes to healthcare, the NFPA does a really good job of focusing on the healthcare, um, whereas the IBC is more general um, construction, um, so they're more universal. But for the sake of your training and your education, I want to stick with NFPA because the the, the authority is having jurisdiction. Um, and CMS pretty much are good with these terms and definitions. And I think, again, if you can get your hands or head around this, um, you'll definitely be good enough and well-informed enough to be able to work in healthcare and have a, a good understanding. So I want to talk about basically four types of walls. Uh, smoke partitions, uh, we'll go into these in more detail in a minute, um, which are not fire rated. Uh, fire barriers, which are one, two, three, and four R ratings. Smoke barriers, sometimes called smoke fire barriers, are one, two, and three R ratings. And again, those ratings are important. And then a fire wall, not to be confused with the fire barrier, which have two, three, 
and for our ratings. Smoke partitions, okay, now smoke partitions are designed to stop the passage of smoke. They do not have a fire rating, very, very, very important. They do not have a fire rating. Um, the ceiling tiles are, or hard ceilings may be considered part of the enclosure if sprinkled. And this is very important in our profession because so many times these partitions are on the corridors which pass into uh, rooms and spaces. And we do a lot of work, you know, going taking electrical wires or nurse comm wires or communication cables, whatever it is into these rooms or offices, and they can get us into a lot of trouble. Um, and if we're able to work above the ceiling and not have to worry about, you know, the issue with uh, barrier management because it's a partition and we have a ceiling and a wall that's constructed in such a way that it's acting as the partition, this is certainly a tremendous savings in money and time and effort and on and on and on. So very, very valuable and very important that you know the difference between your smoke partitions and your um, smoke barriers. And again, I make a comment here, it does not require the red stuff. Um, when you have a smoke partition because it's not a rated wall, it doesn't require for it to be filled in, with intermessive material or fire caulk. It basically needs to be filled with something that will prevent the passage of smoke, which again, many times it can be normal construction material, um, i.e. Uh, drywall mud or things like that. Just, to, just again, again, you got to just stop the passage of smoke. A very important distinction. Now, fire barrier, and that's very easy. Fire barriers are pretty simple. They, they designed to stop the spread of fire from one area to another. Uh, barrier starts at the floor. It ends at the top of the deck. Again, another very important distinction. It's going to go all the way from floor to deck. And when it comes to fire barriers, you will see these in a number of locations. You sometimes will see these in older construction or hazardous spaces because there was not as much sprinkling back then, whereas those spaces today in new construction might be actually be partitions. Um, and you'll also definitely see these when it comes to stairwells and you'll see these for, for separation of buildings, uh, sorry, yeah, separation of buildings or separation of occupancies. That's typically where you see your fire barriers where you're, you're you, you probably even see it like in laboratories. Uh, cause sometimes if they have hazardous material or the rate of hazardous, they'll have separations and particularly like your mechanical spaces, your boiler rooms and utility plants will have fire barriers separating that space from the rest of the occupancy. That's a common use of fire barriers. Um, and again, it's important to note they go from the floor to the deck. Smoke barriers, and this is the one that sometimes gets us quite a bit of confusion because we hear smoke barrier and we often confuse it with smoke partition. And then we hear smoke barrier and we often confuse it with fire barrier. Um, a smoke barrier has a very specific purpose in the sense that it designed to stop the spread of fire and smoke from one area to another. And it runs from exterior wall to exterior wall, runs floor to deck, and it's fire rated. Now, a smoke barrier, what it does is it creates what's called compartmentalization. Uh, smoke barriers are designed to give the folks in healthcare a place to refuge when there's a fire or if there's a smoke situation. They can go from one side of the floor, if you will, to the other side of the floor and be protected from the smoke without having to go down the stairwells um, they can again they can move horizontally if you will across the facility but it's very important to know that these barriers that while they go from floor to deck uh, they also go from wall to wall again they create a compartment that is from exterior to exterior very important function and they are also they have a fire rating so these are a combination I guess you could say smoke fire barrier but when we say smoke barrier and that word barrier very important that's what that means so that's that's a critical understanding that you need to have when it comes to you know the interpretation of what a wall what kind of wall it is the next wall which is a firewall which is not something that we typically deal with very often um, as healthcare facility managers you will deal with it during major major construction and this is really when you are dealing with the exterior of your building um, when you're dealing with buildings that are, uh, you know, separate buildings all together, or if you're about to go outside of your building and add on to your building, um, these are designed to stop the spread of fire from one building to another, and they run from the basement to the roof line. 
So typically, you're going to see these on the exterior um, of your buildings. Uh, you're going to see them when you're transitioning. Let's maybe from, um, I mean, you may have a hallway that goes, uh, maybe it's a walkway even yet, that, that's turning into a hallway that's connecting building from building or a bridge or something like that. But that exterior part of the building is the fire wall. And we won't spend but th very much time. In fact, this is about all the time we're going to spend on firewall altogether is what we're talking about right here. But just want you to understand the distinction between firewall and fire barrier. A fire barrier is not necessarily a firewall. Okay. Now, they can be one and the same. Um, and they can be used as, in terms of one and the same. But typically, a wall is an exterior. You'll see lots of fire barriers inside the building. And occasionally you'll see a fire barrier that's part of a fire wall on the exterior. But by and large, a fire wall will not be inside your building. That's the key thing here. You're not going to have a fire wall inside your building. It's going to be on the exterior. I hope that makes that uh, nice and clear. Let's go on to the next thing. Okay, so let's take a look at a drawing here that helps us to sort of get a sense of how, how this works. Um, if you look at the this here, we've got a nice legend here on this drawing. It says smoke partition. Then you have your one hour fire barrier, or, or, or and it says also says smoke barrier. There's also two hour fire um, barrier or smoke barrier, and then you have a four hour uh, smoke bear fire and smoke barrier. So those are some pretty high rated uh, barriers. Um, I think it's a bit unusual to have something notated as a two hour fire barrier, but then also smoke barrier in the same thing with the four hour. Typically that's just straight up fire barrier. And then they, they decide to go ahead and distinguish between a smoke barrier, one hour smoke barrier, which is, as we were discussing earlier, is also a rated wall or it's rated for fire. And let's start right there with that because that's one of the things that we want to look at first here. I want to take a look at this this blue line right here and you see this exterior wall and you see how this comes across and then it travels across here and again I'm going to assume that this goes back to another exterior wall making this whole compartment one compartment or one barrier. You also see something that's a bit unusual if you go over here you look at this line right here and you might say well Mike where's the exterior well if you look inside this says court uh, yard if you could blow that up and so this is the exterior going to a courtyard it comes across here and then this is a, what's a little bit unusual and you see this very frequently is that it ties into a two hour again it's a higher rated and that's one reason probably why they call it a smoke barrier is because it's it there's a combination of wall here this two hour rated firewall that is also part of creating the continuation if you will of this compartment so you have this compartment right here, and you'll see how that blue, again, and that's very important because what they're saying is that, that is a one hour rated. So if you were to look over the ceiling, you'll see there's one hour rating there. And when you get over here, all of a sudden you'll see a two hour rating over here, okay? If you were to look above the ceiling. It, and it's not always notated or annotated, but typically you may see uh, annotations above the ceiling where it say two hour rated. But that is all part of the same continuous wall creating another compartment. Um, interesting enough, if you go over here, you see this, this two hour rated wall right here, and it's also a smoke barrier. So this is what's helping create this compartment. And here is this wall right here going from exterior to exterior. And again, they could have possibly, I guess, just called it a two hour rated wall and it would have been understood. It, it's also a smoke barrier. But in order for, I guess, for, for folks to understand that this is part of compartmentalization as well, they put the smoke barrier designation along with it to say that this compartment, this is the smoke barrier, and it just so happens to be a two-hour rated wall also that is separating this. And you might ask yourself, well, now why is this a two-hour rated wall? Well, this could have been an addition. Uh, that's one, one possibility. This could have been an addition, or this could have been a total separate occupancy at some point in time. Uh, might have been a different business uh, in the past. And so, but, but when they decided to expand and they put the compartments in space, they didn't want to quote derate the wall. So they just kind of made this the, um, and you see this a lot in healthcare. When we add on 
we do all kinds of interesting things when it comes to these walls. They may have been one thing at one point in time, and then they become another thing at another point in time. And so it does create a lot of confusion for us as the facility folks. Um, then we get into uh, what the next thing I want to do is let's look at another to our, I guess, wall and barrier. You can see this one here running from this exterior, if you will, and it travels along and it circles and it comes across the corridor there. Now these doors are here are very interesting doors across this corridor because when you go across the corridor, you know, you're going to have these very heavy uh, positive latching um, steel doors that are rated for an hour and a half or 90 minute doors that um, probably on hold opens. But again, they have a very specific rating with, you know, with a, uh, uh, when you're inspecting them. So they're a little different. Same thing here. There's some very unusual doors going across here that you have to be very much aware of. Another thing that's going to be very interesting too is that, and you, you'll see this maybe coming through here. This is a very interesting crossing right here because any openings in this wall, all the openings have to be 90 minute rated. And for people who work in these areas, especially in here, you know, they're probably sometimes a little confused, but why is this such a heavy door? Why does it have a closer on it? Why is it positive latching? You know, maybe we put a hold open on here and put ahead to put a hold open on here. But these are 90 minute doors going through here, which can create a lot of confusion because right around the corner, this folks over here, right in this space right here, they may have just a regular old door. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have any hold open. It's just a, a regular old door, nothing special about it. But this door here is going to be very, very special going into this space. So it makes it, for, makes it be very confusing. Same thing back here. There may be an entrance there, maybe not. But in any case, it, this wall, and anytime you make a penetration in one of these walls, guess what? You've got a much, much more major construction than you do if you're just going to go through, let's say, a wall or a door or something over here. You know, anything in here, you can do, kind of do whatever you want. But something over here, guess what? You have to think totally different about that wall. So very important that you know what your walls are and what your construction types are. Now I want to drop down to um, your partitions. And I want to walk over to this space particularly. When you look at this space right in here, you can see how this whole area, and you see how they highlighted in yellow the egress corridor. So what they've done is they've protected the egress going out to the exits, you know, and you see the yellow. And then everything in here, because I think this is where patients are, this is where patients sleep. Uh, for, for those reasons, this is how the patients are getting out. What they've done is they've protected these corridors so from smoke. And so they have the smoke partitions in here. Again, this is not a rated wall. I don't know if it goes up to the deck. It may not. It may only go to the ceiling. Um, the doors that are in these, yes, they have to have... Um, they, have, they don't have to have a rated label on them, but they do have to be a certain construction type and they have to have a certain ability to, um, you know, each of these doors have to have the ability to prevent smoke from passing through them. You know, that's passed what's called, I guess, the cold smoke test. Um, and they all have to be inspected. All these doors in here have to be inspected for smoke, not fire, but smoke. And they have very specific you know, evaluations as far as, you know, just to make sure, mainly it's just to make sure that nothing is damaged on the, um, on the, on the equipment that, that maintains the, uh, the gap or the closure for smoke. And then, and of course, any, any, uh, any doors that would be in any rated one hour above would have to have another inspection of a whole nother kind. Um, again, right here, you got a two hour wall. That's a 90 minute inspection. Over here, you have a one-hour smoke barrier. That's a different kind of smoke door in the hallway, possibly. Um, it's going to be a different type altogether. It may not even be latching. Uh, that, that door may just be, uh, you know, there may be egress double doors that swing both ways. Uh, they they not, don't necessarily have to be latching. Um, they don't even necessarily have to have a rating on them. They could be 20-minute doors with uh, no label. And that can be very confusing. Wow, why do we have this really... 20 minute no label door over here but over here we got this really heavy duty latching doors and then next thing over here oh we're back to our unrated 20 minute three quarter inch doors and same thing over here or someone may have decided you know i'm going to put one hour doors they're going to be positive latching they're going to have you know the egress uh push bar on it and everything so it can be very confusing as you can see when it comes to understanding 
you know, what is what. But for the sake of this particular uh, um, le a lecture, really, I just want you to see examples of how these walls work and where they're located and how these barriers work and how sometimes it can be confusing how they can blend into each other to complete their objective, particularly over here. This was a good example right here. And again, and then also get an idea of how partitions play in. And if you look around too, you can see, for example, here's an elevator shaft that's protected. And this, those are fire rated and has a 2R rating on it. And you'll see other hazardous spaces protected with fire ratings, which is pretty normal and typical. So I'm hoping, again, by looking at this drawing, tying it to what we just talked about, you get to start getting a more competent understanding of what you might come up against, especially as facilities are added to and expanded on year after year, um, you know, construction project after construction project. Uh, now I want to jump into a little more about barrier management. And let's start by talking about fire stopping. A fire stop is a fire protection system made of various components used to seal openings and joints in fire resistant rated walls and or floor assemblies. For penetrating cables, these can also be called a multi-cable transit and you'll see those very much more commonly in new construction. Fire stops designed to restore the fire resistance rating of, of the wall and or floor and assembly by impeding the spread of fire by filling the openings with fire resistant materials. Um, Unprotected openings in fire uh, separations cancel out the fire resistance ratings of the fire separations, allowing the spread of fire, usually past the limits of the fire safety plan of a building. So bottom line is, you know, we have openings and openings can create danger and we have to know how to fill them. Um, the different types of locations that we deal with, and it's, it's pretty obvious really in most cases, uh, top of wall joints, which is typically not so obvious, it's actually an area that gets us in trouble quite a bit. Floor joints, the wall, and the floor. The wall and the floor, are, we get it. We get the wall and the floor. We under, seem to understand that pretty well as far as needing to be sealed. But when the joints on the floor joints and the wall joints come together, that's, again, a place where we sometimes get ourselves. You know, here's an example of joints. You know, um, you have corrugated uh, uh, a roof or a ceiling um, in, in over here, uh, over here to the left. And sometimes when the, con con when the contractors do that work, it's hard to make um, everything match up nice and tight, but the fire stop will definitely fill that. And then you see something again over here on the right hand side, you see the, um, you know, a, a slab edge where you've got a lot of, um, you know, uh, if you will, you have a lot of construction or uh, wall forms here coming down to the ground. And that's sometimes hard to, to uh, seal when you have two hard surfaces coming together to make sure that it's solid. So these joints, is, is, is a really a easily overlooked area if someone's not real meticulous when it comes to doing construction. And, and candidly, um, I have very rarely seen sealed joints like I'm looking at in these pictures in my facilities. Um, in fact, in most cases, there's fire stop blowing up on the ceiling that's covering up those areas um, in what I've seen from my buildings. And down at the joints on the floor, Again, I, I can't really say, I can't think of too many times I've ever seen them looking kind of like these images. Obviously, these are, these are jobs that are done, pretty, done very well. Again, wall and floor, these are the obvious ones. Uh, we see these uh, frequently. Um, uh, these are nice and clean looking. You know, one to the left is a wall joint with a lot of penetration, a lot of conduit going through. The one on the right is, is conduit going through the floor. Although after having gone through a lot of reading and research, one of the questions that jumps right out at me immediately looking at the picture on the right is, um, you know, you're allowed so much area um, in concrete or in penetrations through the floor or through everything, dependent upon the thickness of the, the wall or the floor. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. When I look at this, I, I wonder, hmm, I wonder if this has exceeded the, um, the hole or diameter size or the area size you're allowed when you go through um, a floor like this. Important to understand that there are really two different kind of penetrations that you need to clearly understand. You have a through and a membrane penetration. Uh, through penetrations travel through both sides of the wall. Very important to understand this. And another, I'll, I'll point this out, I think, later too, and that is that when you go through a fire barrier or smoke barrier, um, you're going to have to seal both sides not just one side. I think that was a misconception I had for a number of years 
you know, it, you know, and sometimes it's easy to get to one side, but it's not so easy to get to the other side. And I do wonder how many times people address both sides. Now, membrane penetrations are different. They only travel through one side, and this is often very common when you have to deal with electric or plumbing, because you're just you have to run the uh, the plumbing or the electrical down inside of the wall, so you're just going through just the membrane. In that case, of course, you can seal just the one side. Um, it's important because the UL lists different systems based on through versus membrane, so it's very important when you approach um, your management process your barrier management process you know which way so you know how much you're going to use and what kind of ul listing you're going to use or that the contractor will use now fire stopping ul listing i've mentioned that a few times something to understand about this is that joints floors and wall penetrations are really what we're looking at and what ul listings are about uh, joints really are any joint between the fire rated components such as a wall to wall a floor to wall a, a wall to ceiling etc um, is a joint uh, penetration UL coating. Um, F, if you see coating that has an F, it's for the floor, a W is for the wall, and a C is a combination of the two. Any opening in rated walls or floors, including MEP penetration. So whenever you have any, any penetration at all, you're going to have a UL coating for it that's identifying what it's going through by the FWC um, coating. There are unique fire stop systems for virtually every type of penetration uh, variable. So I, I, I was trying to find out how many there were. I, someone told me um, some years ago how many there were. And I think at the time, I, I don't quote me on this, but I think it was in the hundreds anyway. There were hundreds and hundreds, maybe 600 different ratings, and it may have been higher, or uh, UL listings. Well, there are various type of penetrations. I mean, if you have a cable, different cables, like you have a cable and PVC pipe, there's a UL listing. If you have, um, you know, like a coax cable and you have a copper pipe, there's a different listing. Um, if you have, you know, a copper pipe uh, with uh, a conduit, there's a different listing. You know, wire trays. Um, and all these combinations, every one of them has a different listing and a different detail. And it's actually quite mind boggling. Uh, now granted, the way they address them may be similar, but they actually will detail them out and they also take much more into consideration than just the penetration. They take the wall construction into consideration as well. And so by the time you mix all these things together, it becomes exponentially complex in terms of the number of listings that are out there. Important note here, when there is no UL approved detail, and I'm sure someone comes up with something different all the time, then an engineering judgment may, may be issued. Now, an engineering judgment is when you have a professional engineering company, um, could be a, a mechanical company, could be um, Hilti, it could be uh, just somebody who has engineering uh, stamping abilities. And they come out and they make a decision that whatever they decide as the solution is good enough. They'll detail it up and typically submit it to the AHJ and it'll be a, it's typically approved. Um, obviously, if you give that much attention to a penetration, you're typically going to get it, you will get it approved. So that's a very important understanding to have as well if you find something that's not UL listed. Uh, UL first stop system examples, and here's one here we're going to go over for a little bit. CAJ-1044 would be a, an example of a listing type. Uh, as we spoke about earlier, you already understand that C is either floor or wall or a combination of floor or wall. The A or J would say that it's a concrete floor or wall with a minimum thickness less than or equal to five or eight inches. So it's giving you the, the, the thickness and the, or the, how thick the wall or the floor might be. Um, the 1000 to 1999, it specifies the types of metallic piping and diameters. And we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. And then the um, 1044, uh, the 44 is the 44th system in the thousand series of metallic uh, metallic penetrations so that tells you it is the 44th series and, and again so you can find it as far as ul listings goes here you, you'll see that there's a one and um and that's telling you the floor and the wall assembly and what's interesting is it, it doesn't it doesn't just tell you the thicknesses of the floor it will talk about how much diameter or how big you can go as far as the um um, as far as the diameter of the penetration, I found this very interesting. So if you look up here, it talks about thicknesses of the floor 
And then you get down here and it talks about hollow core or solid to solid. And then it talks about if it is um, for a solid or lightweight concrete, it's 32 inch max diameter opening in the floor. Okay. If it's of hollow core or precast, it is seven inches. What a difference. So, I mean, you certainly have to know um, the difference here. Obviously, this, th this here would probably be a floor, and this might possibly be. Um, I'm not sure what kind of floor that would be, but it's it's definitely pretty light light uh, um, a lighter 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 work there, and then you get to the steel sleeves, and again similarly, it's going to talk about the maximum I, um, diameter, um, and it's going to talk about what schedule you can use in the floor the floor of the wall, and then this is another interesting little note. It says it may extend two inches above the top of the floor or beyond either side of the wall, um, and then it talks about a max 16 inch inside diameter or smaller and it even talks about the wall thickness of the steel okay and it talks about how long how far it may extend beyond the surface half an inch so you know floor you got you got very specifics on how big how big diameter you have here steel sleeve you got very specifics of the diameter of the steel sleeve and you had the diameter of everything and then the through penetrations it starts talking about the through penetrations and when you get to those it talks about the different diameters you're allowed to dependent upon what it is in a case of steel pipe 30 inch diameter or smaller schedule 10 or heavier iron pipe 30 inch or smaller cast or ductile iron pipe conduit nominal six inch diameter or smaller rigid steel conduit nominal four inch diameter steel electrical metallic tubing and copper tubing six inch diameter or smaller um, type l or heavier copper tubing so you can, get, you can see how it gets very specific and you can have a lot of interesting combinations when it comes to a penetration. And again, there's another one here for copper uh, pipe. And the packing material. It uh, talks about you know the packing material that you need inside there. And this packing material is used to support the caulking. So you have to have that behind it so it doesn't just fall in. And then uh, the fill void or cavity material. It talks about what kind of caulk you can use um, inside the space that's left over and how thick it needs to be and then you get over here and you get into this very specific thicknesses of the of the floor or the wall and the pipe again how big and the annular space how how large you're allowed that's the space left over and then minimum caulk thicknesses okay dependent upon the rating okay of the space or the wall that you're going through so this gets very 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 complex Let's talk about some of the other, the other terms that we didn't talk about that you saw in those in those um, in the paper in the document there. Annular space. That's the gap between the penetrating item and the hole. Okay, so that's the gap that's left over. Um, the backer rod material. Materials used support for 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 gunned or trialed sealant materials. Um, so you got to have that back there behind it so you can sit there and when you so it doesn't all again so it doesn't fall in. I, I'm sure if you've done any working with um, mortar or anything else. If you don't have it, it, it just, it, it falls in and it doesn't uh, um, seal properly. Intumescent, we've talked about this before. Intumescent material, which is uh, material that swells in the presence of heat. Um, and it seals the gap around a penetration. Again, another little minor note here. If it is a firewall and a firewall and only a firewall or a fire barrier, it only a fire barrier, um, it doesn't necessarily have to, quote, be all the way sealed 100 percent however if it is any kind of smoke barrier um, or smoke partition it needs to quote pass the daylight test you can't have light going through it uh, point of contact uh, when a penetrating item makes contact with the hole uh, ul fire resistance directory the publication which contains detailed descriptions for all fire stopping systems and fire resistance rating an hourly rating defined by building codes for the endurance of types of construction to resist fire. So those are a couple extra or review on definition. Now, when you saw that document earlier, and I didn't touch on it, I want to touch on it now, and that is you saw these other ratings here. Uh, you saw the ratings that says something to the effect of F rating, which makes pretty simple and straightforward to us. Then there's the T rating and L rating. Okay. Now, what are those about? Well, Let's take a look. We have some definitions here to go through. Um, 
Also located in the UL Resistance Directory, Volume 2, are the FT and L ratings for each Firestop system. Uh, these are hourly ratings that indicate specific performance capabilities and correspond to building code requirements. Okay, the F rating. This is the simple one. Uh, the time period for which the system is capable of prohibiting the passage of flame. So we talk about that all the time, fire rating. The T rating, which is the time period for which the system is capable of limiting the maximum temperature rise on the unexposed surface of the wall or floor assembly, on the penetrating item, and on the fill material in the angular space, not to exceed 325 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient temperature and requires acceptable hose stream performance. Again, hose stream performance is one of those tests they do where they actually sit there and they will hit that with a hose and it needs to stand up to it. And I think that's one of the things that, I think that's one of the things that we don't consider sometimes when it comes to um, when we're filling and the fact of the matter is that when there's a fire, they're going to hit it with a hose. And if we didn't do our job right, it's just going to blow it right out if we didn't do it right. And it's, it's one of those things that we don't ever think is ever going to happen, I think. And so we just uh, don't consider the effect, the impact of maybe not doing the job the right way. The L rating um, designation is information concerning the amount of air leakage in the cubic feet per minute per square foot of opening through the fire stop system and or 400 degree Fahrenheit air temperature at an air pressure differential of 30 inches water column or 0.30 inch water column. So again, there is also a rating for air and I'm, I'm not very familiar with this myself. I, I um, as I was going through this, this training and I was getting information for this, I was just like, wow, I had no idea. And I'm not sure who even thinks to test these things like this. And that is a reason why I guess, you know, they have this UL rating system and the ones that are rated are tested. So you can count on the fact that a lot of folks have put a lot of time into classifying um, these systems. Available products that you see out there, uh, intumescent silicone latex and acrylic caulks are very common. Um, that's pretty much what we see used most of the time by most folks in, in facilities. Uh, elastomeric sprays, uh, elastomeric sprays, I, I've never actually used those. I've not seen them used. I've seen them used in um, pictures and images and such. Um, I can imagine that these are definitely used for joints. Uh, putties and putty pads, collar wraps, adjustable sleeves. Again, those are becoming very, very common. See those all the time anymore, new construction. And pillows, foam, and mortar. Um, again, that's also very, very common and has been for quite a few years now. And uh, I, I see those again quite a bit. Um, in the industry. Um, fire stopping installations. A large majority of fire stopping work today is not installed correctly. You're probably not surprised by that because I think very, very few people who do the work in facilities are trained um, or have gone to training on doing this or do it enough to know. Um, I, I would be amazed if you walked around and asked folks who've been doing fire stopping for years about UL listings and ratings. Um, I have done that. Um, you know, I introduced UL listings and ratings at my facility, but to be candid, I didn't push it really, really hard. Um, you know, one of the things that is being pushed out there by the vendors and the manufacturers is that we need to have uh, UL listing and ratings uh, notated at the place in which we do the um, penetration, where the penetration is at, and that there needs to be a label there. Um, to me, be candidly from a financial and time perspective um, with all the things that we have to do uh, and the fact that we're not being required to do it um, I certainly felt you know, I was gonna wait till a new hospital to do something like that I just couldn't even see or think about the time the energy and the effort to do that in an existing hospital that, that had really had never been done before um, so you know I'm not surprised that you know a, a lot are not installed correctly um, but again, we, we're, we're work, working for different day one, and this is one of those things that, you know, um, education uh, makes you aware and you can no longer be ignorant. And we got to figure out ways to do this better. And I think it is a great idea to understand UL listings and to do it better and to do it correctly. Um, the key factor, as you mentioned, is just unskilled workers um, who are uneducated doing the work. And then a general lack of understanding that all fire, all fire stop work must be done in accordance with UL details. You know, it, it is a requirement. Again, it hasn't been pushed, but like everything else, it's like layers of an onion. And I see them pushing more and more and more and more on things that we have been ignoring over time. And again, I'd like to think that just like with the ASHRAE 188, which has to do with Legionella's, which, which kind of hang out there for a long time before it started getting pushed. And now it's just starting getting pushed. 
um, that had that had about a 10 to 15 year cycle before they start pushing on it and even now we're just beginning with that so I can see this coming down the road although there is a little bit of pushback to be candid with you because the amount of time and money and energy we're spending on fire stopping um, is being um, pushed back against by the safety record we have in healthcare, particularly hospitals. Um, we have a tremendous safety record and my, primarily it's because sprinkler systems are so effective and our fire alarm systems are so effective anymore. So there is a little bit of pushback. I don't know how, if it's going to be able to push back far enough that we're not going to pay nearly as much attention and go this route with it. But for now, this is the direction it's going and I wouldn't be surprised if it keeps going this direction. Uh, we are going to have to have um, you all ratings for every penetration notated up in the space, you know, for the surveyors to see. So especially kind of a going forward thing. So keep it in mind um, that, you know, we need to do better at this. And um, it's an issue that is coming to the day, in the light of day. And I think that each one of you is going to have a profound effect on the future of where we go when it comes to proper barrier management. You know, here's an example right here I wanted to kind of leave you with. You know, how will this be fire stopped? And again, do you think there's a UL detail for this one? In my opinion, absolutely. We got gypsum. Um, we have a couple of copper pipes, you know, with a certain diameter. And now you know enough already to say, okay, yeah, I could probably look this up. Um, in your training material this week, um, I, I, I linked you to um, a couple of sites that help break down how to read a UL listing. I also linked you to some sites that how to look up UL listings. I uh, would really encourage you to um, to do that, you know, look it up, um, take a look at examples, um, get kind of familiar with it. Again, this is one of those things where if we're going to expect our staff to do this in the hospital, then we better have a good understanding of what we're expecting them to do um, because we're holding them accountable. Something that I like to say um, as a way of trying to um, uh, articulate to my staff and management the responsibility I had and have as a director and that is that directors go to jail I like to say and managers and staff generally don't because directors are representatives of the organization that sign off on things that are legally binding whereas a manager and a staff member generally don't they don't have a legally binding signature so you know it's very important to you especially as you promote up to a director level that when it comes to issues like this, you know, these things are considered, quote, white collar crime. In other words, ignorance isn't, you can't always plead ignorance. And if someone were to die in a fire and they were to trace it back to the fact that the building was not well maintained. Now, that's a stretch, I understand. Um, you know, in the past, they, they might have been just a little more frowning and, you know, and, and a slap on the hand and a fine. But anymore, white collar crime is being looked at differently. And again, that director label is what you got to keep in mind. If you're a director or above, you know, white collar crime can and may mean prison time. So, you know, one of the reasons to push our level of professionalism is not just to quote, avoid prison time, but really it's to understand the, um, the critical nature of our jobs. I think that's really what I'm trying to stress here. And that's why there is potential prison time for a director because you have a critical job. You're supposed to learn to do it right. I understand there's lots of pressure to just get the job done, but we have, you know, we can stay ahead of the curve here is what I believe. I believe that we can stay ahead of the curve. We can show good faith efforts and we can layer by layer by layer become the professionals that we're always meant to be for our profession. So I hope this has really helped you understand that. And uh, again, different day one is our model. And I really believe that this is one of those things that had I had this 20 some years ago going into healthcare, trust me, it would have been a different day today in the facilities that I directed. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this presentation um, on barrier management. I believe again, this with the other uh, lectures should help give you kind of a, a comprehensive understanding of barrier management unlike most folks have ever had going into healthcare day one. Um, you know, we're going to have another section that I think is probably the capstone of all of this, which is going to be talking about um, um, above ceiling permitting. Um, and I really believe that that is really the crux of, of all of this conversation is above ceiling permitting. So we're going to talk about that. And again, I, I really do, uh, I, I know that this presentation, I'm going to continue to sharpen this presentation. Um, 
and pull this together. But I think this is definitely enough, definitely enough to have you walk into a building completely with your eyes open, unlike most folks ever have before walking into a building, unless, of course, they were a fire uh, life safety, uh, you know, barrier management expert prior to going into healthcare, which is very few folks uh, coming into healthcare and facilities management. So again, I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to um, hearing from you all in the future, how this may um, have completely changed the way you look at things and also the challenges you're going to have. Uh, trust me, there are a lot of challenges to make this happen. And uh, this is going to be years and years and years of work but I am confident, I am very confident that we, get our, we can get our hands around this and we can truly be the professionals that we are meant to be as healthcare facilities leaders.